So hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, deciding to attend this talk. Um, as Vicky said, I'm involved in this project. This is a uh, Horizon 2020 project. Andrea is involved as well, so she can uh, corroborate or correct me if I say something wrong. <laughs> And the idea of today is to discuss with you um, how we are literally making sense of the data that we have and that we are creating in order to get a final product that is this web portal that Vicky was mentioning. And I would like to give you like a short introduction on what is the landscape of data that we start from, the methodology that we are using to organize the knowledge in high level uh, terms, and uh, how we are designing the final product, let's say. So just a brief introduction, polyphonia, which is the Latin pronunciation, but you, you can call it polyphonia or like, as you like, is this massive project that we have that includes 10 small pilots, um, pilot projects. And this is a brief overview of what they are and what they deal with. So we have, for example, a a project that is called Child that is about collecting documentary sources on the usage of music with children. Or we have meetups that is uh, very similar to Child, but the scope is kind of different. So looking for documentary sources, like from the, in particular from the British Library and from some other historical databases about the chronology of meetings between artists over time. Mm -hmm. We have two pilots dedicated to the history of instruments. One is dedicated to the history of organ production in, in the Netherlands and in the surrounding areas. One is dedicated to the soundscape of bells and specifically and particularly in Italy. So how they were built, what are the repertoires of these bells and how they sound. So what is exactly the soundscape of, of the cities in Italy? We have a pilot that is dedicated to one city, in particular the city of Bologna, that is the one where I work, and it's dedicated to reconstruct the history of music, meaning all the performances, the artists, and so on, that traveled or that passed by uh, Bologna, which is known in Italy as the city of music. Then we have more technical uh, pilots, let's say, that are dedicated to cross-linking information between data sources. So having sources that talk about more or less the same things, but maybe they are slightly different described, or having sources that talk about the same things, but at different levels. So imagine we have a data source with the scores of a musician, and we have a data source that describes uh, music features like melody, harmony, and so on of this compositions. And we have maybe another source where we describe biographical information about the composer. So imagine put all these things together. We have a pilot dedicated to uh, more analytical tasks, like how to query this structure music information. We have another pilot that is dedicated to the discovery of similarity patterns between music, possibly between different genres and one that is dedicated to the evolution of um, methods, say, for, um, for, uh, for, for creating music. So especially uh, working on tonality and modality and the way this generated over time. And then we have kind of an outsider that is the, the only pilot that doesn't really produce data, but that works uh, in, in real world. And it's meant to create um, tools to let people with hearing impairment to, to enjoy music with haptic tools. So like imagine with um, bracelets and uh, others, other, other objects that allow them to understand or to feel the music. The overall objective of the project is to collect data sources and to create new data sources when these do not exist yet. So extracting information from documents or from existing databases and so on, and create knowledge about the music heritage of Europe, more or less. Of course, the, the, the scope is much broader, but let's say that the focus is on the European music heritage. We want to create this data so that we can answer questions and every pilot has his own set of questions of scope and methods to answer those questions because remember that each pilot of course is a small research project. And then we want to share all this information with let's say lay people okay so we want to use uh, these research results 
and share them for educational and entertainment purposes. So we are not going to create a set of tools or um, algorithms and so on that are just meant for experts, but we want to share this, this knowledge that we found with everybody. And now it comes the problem because, and it's actually the, the, the main topic of this talk, that is you understood possibly from all these nine and 10 pilots that we have a huge diversity of topics and methods and questions and so on. And we need to create one final result. So how to put all these things together in one single resource is the objective of uh, the web portal of Polyphonia. In particular, the, the challenging aspect is that we want to create something that does the thing that we just said, so that provides an environment for specialized users, that provides an environment that is where also lay people feel comfortable and enjoy exploring the contents. So contents that are designed for everyday um, people, I don't know how to say. And it allows, it's an environment that allows you to basically build in a crescendo, as we would say in uh, musical terms, so, so that all the users are able to enjoy as far as they can and as much as they know and they can understand. The problem is that considering the, the pilots that we have, it's really challenging to create something that harmonizes everything and doesn't just create a project that is the sum of 10 different projects. And we have several challenges here. I just wanted to highlight which ones are in general terms. We have challenges from the side with respect to data management. So we have plenty of sources that we need to include in this final web portal. So we have the need to centralize this information so that we can access it easily and fast. And, but of course there are issues in this because it requires a lot of storage and this project is a five year, four, four year project. So we need to create something that is sustainable in the long term. Therefore, we are trying also to move to another approach that is to decentralize everything, meaning everybody, every single project handles his own data and provides access to this data. But then it comes another problem that when data are scattered around the world, literally, then it's a problem to access information fast. And uh, the final result is not always very usable because it requires maybe uh, long loading time and so on. So it cannot be very scalable, especially if you are talking about uh, big data sources. <clears throat> and then we have another set of challenges that derive from uh, the organization of all this information. So as you can imagine, we are talking literally about everything that is related to music. So compositions, scores, audio files, people, events, places, anything, right? That can be related to uh, this type of heritage. We decided to go for, um, for using linked open data. That is this technology that basically deals with data organized in graphs because it's possibly the best way for us to organize so much different type, uh, so, so many different types of, of information. And we need to have a bottom-up approach. So we need to start from the pilots that we have and then go to the general. So starting from the details of every single pilot and then generalize what we get. And then there is the third set of challenges that is the dissemination. As you, could, as you can imagine, we need to serve this specialistic information both to lay people and to scholars. And the results doesn't have to be naive for, uh, for specialists, but doesn't have to be too specialized for lay people. Otherwise, nobody would use it because it's not targeted on any of those uh, type of users. We need to identify what are the competitors. So what are we really creating? What kind of resource do we want to create out of this uh, very heterogeneous knowledge? And then there is a last issue that is how to do all these things exactly using this set of, of, uh, of technologies. I would like to skip the first part. So I will not discuss about data management. I would like to discuss more about knowledge organization and the dissemination challenges for, for today, because I think um, I think Andrea already gave actually a speech uh, about the, the first 
uh, about the first set of problems. So I would like to focus on these two aspects and in particular on the methodology that we are using because we believe it's a methodology that can be reused in other contexts. And uh, it would be nice also to get some feedback if this is sound. So let's start from the organization of the knowledge. When using linked open data, so this type of technology for sharing data, we also need ontologies. What are ontologies? Ontologies are basically vocabularies, including the definitions of the entities or the type of uh, subjects of your data. So in our case, a definition of what is a music work, what is a person, a performance, an instrument, and so on. And what are the possible relations between these data? So how, what are the relations between music works and people? So a person can be the composer, can be a publisher, I can be <clears throat> mentioned in a composition of some musician and so on. And every pilot uh, basically uh, is going to use a set of ontologies because every pilot deals with one of the aspects of the music heritage, but not all of them. So our idea is to create what is called a modular ontology. So basically, you, you, instead of having a huge vocabulary, we have small chunks that define uh, smaller problem spaces. So we have an ontology that is dedicated to the description of music works, another one dedicated to the description of performances and, and so on. And basically every pilot picks the definitions from this shared set of definition and vocabularies. To design this, um, this ontology, and in particular, we call it ontology network exactly because it's modular, so it's composed by several small ontologies. We use this methodology that is called extreme design, and it's a methodology that is very similar uh, to user interfaces design methodologies. Basically, it requires, uh, in a bottom-up approach, to collect requirements from real people meaning you will have to interview people and to define a stereotypical stakeholder, like stereotype of the person that you are interviewing, and this is called persona. For each persona, you may have different stories that are basically the tasks or the interests that this person has. Mm -hmm. And for each story, we need to deconstruct the story and basically grasp what are uh, the main questions that underlie the story, and we call them competency questions. And I make an example. It is a real world example, and it's an actual person that exists, that is Laurent. Laurent is a music journalist, and he has a bachelor in art history. He likes to Google stuff on the web. He doesn't have much technical skills to do this uh, Googling of the things that he likes um, more systematically. Uh, but he does it because every week he publishes information in this newsletter that is called the Music Journalism Insider. So he, he likes to share what he, what he likes and what he found. And he created for himself a Google Doc where he basically stores all the information about the cool sources that he found on the web. And he checks it regularly to find uh, some resource that he likes for example, like a music archive or uh, a music magazine that is online, where to go and open the website and see if there is some interesting news that can be shared in the, in the newsletter. Well, first he's doing all the things manually. He doesn't have a way to uh, make queries, for example, to, to his data because they are in a Google Doc, so he can only do Control F and find a word, but what if he wanted, for example, all the sources related to jazz music or all the sources, uh, all the archival sources related to a person and so on? He doesn't have means to do that. So he would really like to have an online service that does it for him. So to have a registry where you have uh, plenty of music related resources that you can interrogate and that you can get information from. Out of this story, we got this competency questions. So out of the interview, we have question like, okay, what, what Laurent does want? He wants to search for musical content using filters. He wants to know what type of resources can find according to his query. He wants to know if the description of this resource is complete or less or not, whether there are some data maybe attached to the resource or the websites that he's looking for. 
And then he would also like to contribute to this registry because as he's doing in his Google Doc, he would like to include new sources that he found and he would also like find a way to share this information. Now, if we analyze a bit uh, these questions, you will see that there are plenty of nice requirements that emerge from this. So we get information on what type of data we need in order to answer his questions and what type of services we need to create in order to help him to, to solve his problems, right? So where do we go from here? This is a good way, uh, is a nice way, let's say, to uh, understand what are the requirements for, uh, for an application and for creating a new data set. It's a very intuitive way, let's say, to create it, but that's not enough, of course. So what we did, was to use this as a building block of the pipeline for defining systematically content requirements and service requirements for the final application. The first steps of the pipeline is what have you already seen. So applying a person, writing stories about this person and identify the question. Then we use, we top up this methodology with a traditional user interface design methodology that basically extracts the most important questions, clusters the other questions around other topics, and on the basis of this, select the best data views. So how to share this information, which interface do we use to share this information? And lastly, investigates what are the interaction patterns. So what are the questions? Where does a question start from? And what, what do you want to achieve with this question? So, uh, what do you want? What is the actual answer of this question? And of course, then there is the deployment, so the development of a solution and the validation. Let me just give you an example again. So taking again the example of Laurent, what does it mean to extract a driver question? What is a driver question? So out of the set of questions that we design, we have at least one question that is the one that from which all the others depend somehow. So it's the most important, it's the one that defines the problem space. So in our case, I want to search for something. It's the one that defines the main entity of interest. So what do you want to get? What is the result that you're expecting? And it's in this case, musical contents, which means music websites, magazines online and so on. And it also provides you a hint of how to visually place the information on a canvas, let's say, but we can say also on a web page. And this is, for example, these aspects. So the usage of filters. I want to get uh, websites that are relevant to my interests by using filters. So I want only web sources that are related to jets, for example. Then, as I said, we try to cluster the other ones to understand how they contribute to the story. So for instance, we have a set of, of, set of questions that provide context to the main entity, so to the driver uh, question. And we have questions that actually highlight what in communication size is called a call for action. So what the user wants to do once he gets this, this knowledge that he's seeking for. And from this, you can actually grasp some uh, intuitively, you can grasp something about the potential visualization of this information. So here it's quite explicit because the person says it explicitly, like I want to use filters. So you, we know that we are going to create a filter-based exploration for this kind of data set, that we will have several types of filters that we possibly order by relevance and that we will have to clarify what the filters represent and how the data are aggregated under each filter. So we explain the data. And then it's time to decide the interaction patterns. So where, do, where does the user start from and where he wants to arrive? So in general, when we talk about information visualization, we have two main approaches to share knowledge, to share information. There are some cases where you have a data set and you need to explain it to the user. And you first want to give the user an overview of what is available in the data set so that the user knows what is inside, what it can look for and what is not there. So this must be clear from, from day zero, let's say. So you give an overview and then the user may decide to go into the detail of some aspects of the data set as he likes. 
so on demand in this case. And this is a typical pattern that is called overview first and details on demand. And then, of course, there is the, the other side of the medal that is the, the opposite, which is I don't give you anything at the beginning, imagine like Google alike search. So you don't know anything about the data set. You try, you explore, and we expand and we give you more information uh, on demand, uh, on request. In this case, in this story of Florian, you can see that the first pattern, the give overview first and details on demand, is possibly what he wants because he wants to have groupings of content and understand what is the extent of this grouping. So we have 200 resources related to jazz. And then he wants to see additional information on demand. Lastly, he wants some specialized operation that basically go uh, outside this, this the interaction pattern. Once we have this, we arrive to the point where you have to deploy a solution. In this pipeline that we designed, this is not a straightforward pipeline. Like there are cases where one persona may have shared um, bits, let's say, with other personas. So in case there are more personas that are very similar, you should try to cluster, to group them, sorry, and understand the requirements that may satisfy more than one type of user, right? Because there are not only music journalists that are interested in music heritage and so on. If you don't have any other personas, then you know that you must deploy uh, a bespoke solution for this persona. And this is the case of Loran, because I will show you in a bit that we have many other persona, but this was the only persona that had a substantial call for action that was really different from the call for actions requested by other persona. And this is the case of adding and sharing information, which is not part of any other story. In this case, indeed, we decided to develop one specific solution for this type of user. And this is the only exception that I will show you today. And it's the Muso catalog. So this is one of the first results of the project. It's a catalog of online music archives and data sources. It's a website that allows you to see information about music sources that are, of course, somewhere else. That these are cataloged and described by users. So it's a crowdsourced data set. And the user can basically filter what are is interested. So for example, I'm interested in digital libraries or on softwares for, for dealing with music. Or I'm, for example, I'm interested in sources related to jazz. And then you can see a list of what are these sources. Then of course, you can get more detail on demand, as we said. And then you have the call for actions. So you can actually log in or you can add new resources anonymously, okay? That of course will be reviewed by an editorial board and so on. And you can share what you have found on somewhere else. This is more for the socialites, let's say. Behind the scenes, so under the hood of Muso, we had to develop an application that is called Clef which is basically the system that supports the crowdsourcing. It's the one that allows users to get uh, an easy way to produce data. And in particular, this is a linked open data native catalog. So whatever you produce in this Google form-like form is actually already in the final format that we want. We give them some helpers. So for example, the catalog is integrated with Wikidata and with other vocabularies that are already online. So while you type, you get suggestions. The editorial board has access to a backend where you can do the review. And then we provide also means to preserve this information. So the, the data that are created are synchronized with a GitHub repository so that we preserve the versioning and the actual contribution of people to a record so we can store the provenance. So who created, who modified, and what was modified by the user. And then we preserve the data on Zenodo. And uh, a special addition that was a nice request from Andrea is actually, yes, but how about preserving the resources that the users include? So imagine I want to add a music magazine or uh, a music archive that is online and I want it to appear in the registry, but how do I preserve this resource for the next 10 years? And then we included this, this nice feature that 
uh, basically sends a request to the Internet Archive for preserving uh, this web resource, and it does it automatically. Okay. How about granularity and interlinking? So this is the second element of, of heterogeneity problem, let's say. So as I said, Laurent was one exception compared to the other personas that we collected for designing the ontologies. And he was the only one that wanted a specific application. So that the application that was required to uh, satisfy Laurent required something bespoke as bespoke solution. For all the other personas that we have, and here you see some small statistics, we cannot develop it, uh, a bespoke solution for all of them, right? Because we need to create, as we said, one solution that makes everybody happy, more or less. And the pipeline that I just showed you, the one that goes through the creation of stories, personas, but mostly about the analysis, the content analysis of these personas, of these questions, and finding the driver, the clusters, and so on, it's really time consuming, especially if we are talking about like 28 stories and more than 240 questions. So doing it manually is very time consuming. So we decided to have a different approach for all the other personas. So the nine personas, 28 stories and so on. So rather than going through all the single personas, we decided to group them and to annotate them. So here are some examples of other competency questions. For example, take this one as an example because I will use it a lot. There was musical, where was a musical composition performed? This is one question of another persona of another pilot. We annotated this competency question with a classification of the type of data that we need in order to answer the question and with another set of annotations that I will explain. Once we described that, we were able to do an exploratory data analysis, meaning we collected them and we used, rather than having this close reading approach that I showed you with Laurent, we used a distinct reading approach. What does it mean? So, as I said, we classified the question. So we, we estimated that to answer some one question, you may want to rely on these three types of data. There is actually a fourth one, but we are not talking about that today. One type of data is the bibliographic data. So you want historical information about something. More or less, we can say that these are metadata, okay? Metadata that you can find uh, normally in archives and so on. Then you have structured music data. So what, for example, information about the melody, the harmony and the rhythm of composition, because we can use it also to create links between uh, uh, music sources or composers or genres and so on. And then we have linguistic data. So there are data that you extract from the full text of sources. And what does this give us? So this first classification allows us to understand that 70% of all the questions that we collected can be answered, or in order to be answered, they need bibliographic data. Okay, this is a huge percentage. Then there is 36% uh, of these questions that require music data. So features like melody, harmony, and so on. And in order to answer them, 34% of these, they also require music, bibliographic data. So there are questions that mix uh, this type of knowledge, right? So it's not just about asking historical information or about music information, sometimes it's both. Third, there are the linguistic data. Here we have that they, have, they are fundamental to 30% of our 240 questions, 77% of questions that ask for linguistic data also depend of bibliographic data. And 19% of these re rely on the 19% on uh, the 19 of this kind of question also rely on music data. Finally, only the 5% of all the competency question require all three types of data. So historical information, information about melody, harmony, and so on, and information taken from the full text, for example, of the song. <clears throat> In this way, we are able to basically estimate a priority, right? Because we said we have 240 questions, we have a, 
a huge diversity of what we have and what we want to achieve. In this way, we are able to understand that this is our pillar rather than this and this. So, and this is an actually an interesting discovery because most of the personas that we collected are historians, right? Or are musicologists that would, you would think that they would rely on this type of data while instead they are really asking questions that are more on an historical point of view. So they don't just look inside the sources, but they need, as we said, uh, a distant reading approach. And we use this first preliminary analysis to accommodate, let's say, the most representative uh, questions and data. Then we continued our analysis. So we didn't just annotate these, these aspects. So we didn't just classify the competency questions, but we actually annotate them with what we call input and output. Input and output is um, the starting point of a question and the output is the, the actual answer. So take this for example, where was a musical composition performed? You have in your mind a specific music work. So you start from a music work that you know, and as an output, you want a place, right? Because the, the question starts with where. In the middle, there is a, there is a longer pattern. So you're not just looking for one random place that is related to the work, but you are looking for the places of the performances that are related to this work. And this is important to understand how the things get complicated at some point. So we took all the input and output to, under, to estimate what are the actual interests of, of our personas. And we know that most of the people that we interviewed, they started from, uh, they start their question having in mind a specific mus music work or a specific person or a specific document. And most of the time they want either an annotation, an annotation is like a small piece of metadata that cannot be uh, basically simplified as being an entity, like an agent, a source and so on, but maybe they want smaller information like about the style of the document or the role of the person that wrote the source and so on. And they're interested in getting people related to what they are looking for, places and music works. And of course, sources, data, um, document sources of these inputs. From this, we, we make it more complicated, this analysis. So let me try to summarize. We basically look at the dependencies between the inputs and the outputs. And this, in this graph, you see basically all the questions that start from a music work where they actually arrive. So we try to quantify, okay, people start the start questions. They mostly start from music works, from agents and sources. These are basically what you have just seen in the, in the previous um, graph. And they want to arrive here. So we know that when we are looking for sources, we are looking for annotations. Here is the first question that I show you. For example, there are plenty of questions that start from a music work and they want some related place. Then we looked at the actual path because I may want to have places related to a music work, but the connection might be different. It might be the place of production of the music work, it might be the places of performances, it might be the places where the composers were born, right? So we estimated what are the intermediate patterns. So like I have a music work, I have a place, but I have a musical performance in the middle. And we went to analyze this aspect in particular. So we don't have just relation between music works and places, but as I showed you in the, in the question that is again here, we are interested in music works connected to music performances. And in turn, we want to know the agents so the people that participated to these performances and the places of these performances, right? So this gives us a very nice overview of what are the interaction patterns, okay, that we were discussing before. In summary, with this method, we get a grasp of what are the content requirements that we have. So we get the same that we got before by analyzing only Laurent but we get it for all the competency questions. 
we and estimate the priorities. So we need that we need to start from the bibliographic data because those are the ones that are fundamental to most of the questions that we want to answer. We can estimate the content interaction. So where the user starts from and where does he want to arrive? And we can calibrate services on this uh, extent. So to understand what works well for a broad audience and for an audience of experts. And of course, we have to make two strong assumptions here. The first one is that if we group similar competency question by interaction patterns and we use the initial, we can use the initial pipeline on these groups of questions and not just every single persona and every single story and every single competency question. So we can cluster the questions at the beginning and then we can work manually on a smaller set of questions. So from 240, we get 20 competency questions, right? And then we can do it manually. The second strong assumption is that there are patterns that repeat and the ones that they repeat mo the most are probably the ones that also lay people could be interested in too, right? Because they're not very specialistic, probably. And I move towards the last part of the presentation that is about the dissemination. So now we got a grasp of how to design the contents, how to understand what are the patterns that we are looking for. And we need to find a way to harmonize the needs of the final user. So what we did was again to work on the competency questions that I showed you before. So that table, including all the annotations, and we included another set of annotations that is the task of a user that is underlying a certain question. So for example, I showed you uh, what are the places of performance um, of a certain music work. So this type of questions fall under a broad definition of finding an answer to a specific question. So I have a really specific question, okay? And I want to get the answer to that and, and that only. But there are more types of uh, competency questions that you can find. We have competency questions about sharing contents. We have competency questions about searching contents, like can I search for something and so on. We have questions about personalizing contents. So I have this, but I would like to have a different view of what I'm looking for. We have questions that are more like, okay, I'm looking at some content and I would like to know the details, okay? But these are not uh, classified as finding an answer to a specific question. I just want to have more information about this. We have questions that are about finding connections between contents of different types. And we have these three sets of questions that are quite generic. That is, I want to explore the sources related to content that I'm looking at. So like the scores or the documents mentioning a certain music work and so on. I want to discover new contents that I haven't thought about. And I want to discover content that is, that is related to the one that I'm looking at in this moment. So from this activity, we get the tasks that classify, basically allow us to classify um, <clears throat> Uh, generic users and specialized users. So we classify them accordingly. We have a set of examples, like these are kind of questions that exemplify a user, a generic user, like can I share contents? Can I apply filters? Can I discover new things without using filters and so on? And we do the same for the specialized user. So we get the questions that entail those. And we try to mm, divide and conquer, right? We separate them. And we create what we call a journey map. So we decide how is the interaction done on the, on the final web portal on the basis of this. And this journey map starts with the user, the generic user. So we will have an interface where we propose uh, a discovery tool for discovering new information. We will provide in that context means to interact and to personalize with the feed of information that we are providing so that we are deciding to share. We will uh, let the user expand on these stories, let's say, that, the, that we propose them. And we will show in that context relations with different types of data so that it can get an idea of the broader context. And from there, it can move 
to either similar contents or different contents that are related, or in case of an expert that understands the value of the data that he's looking at, he can decide to move to a specialized environment. So this is yet another call for action and move to a dashboard, let's say, where you can interact and play with the data, okay? But being aware of what it's doing. So leaving the comfort zone of the websites that provides you uh, interesting suggestions and so on, and move to a specialized area. <clears throat> Very briefly, we also had to identify competitors because we need to give an identity to this, to this final web portal. So we took into account, we did a competitive analysis with streaming catalogs, magazines, and scholarly projects. We classify them, so we analyze them to understand how this type of information are communicated. So we see that most of the websites use geometric forms to convey this kind of information. They use black and white, so a very simple and plain way to present the contents. And they use uh, sans serif as a typography, meaning uh, fonts that allow you to read fast, or that, sorry, uh, not that they read fast, but that they allow you to grasp the attention, okay? And we also looked at the content organization of this uh, of these websites. So there are several models that are in place. Some of them are quite known, like the single page model, like all the contents of your website is in one page. Then you have things like a flat model where there are really a few web pages that can all be accessed from the main page. Then you have content models like index model and coexisting hierarchy models that basically <clears throat> imply that the main page of, of your, your website is the gateway to other sections of the portal of the website. And all of them have their own index of contents. So you can access all the contents through the web page somehow, but, uh, and you can access them also from sub pages, let's say of the web portal, but everything is guided by a main page. So the, the home. And this is kind of an idea, like we are going to create something that looks like a magazine where we provide recommendations of data stories extracted automatically from the, from the Polyphonia data sets. We will let the user choose what type of user he is. If he's a lazy user, he can just scroll uh, infinitely and see new content. He may decide to tune what he's looking at. So choosing and expressing preferences that, or dive it directly into the dashboards. Every thematic section is connected to a set of competency questions and data patterns that we saw before. While looking at the thematic section, you see a number of examples of these data patterns that we show. So like all the places of performances of a certain music work. And the user can actually interact with the sections because the section will show an example, but the user can change. So for example, imagine and can, and can do it by changing the headings of the section, which is a nice thing. Like imagine you have a section where you have all the performances of Mozart and you can change it and say, no, I don't want Mozart. I want all the performances of Bach. And he can change uh, in, in incrementally the, the application and personalize it. Then we give details on, on demand, as we said. So while looking at a specific instance of a data pattern, you will see some bibli bib sorry, bibliographic information, but also some data visualization that contextualize this information in the context of the whole data set. So providing nice connections to other parts of the data set. And you will also have the call for actions call for actions that are meant for different types of users. Curious people can look for related contents, experts can go to the dashboards at this point, or socialites, for example, can decide to share the chart or the, or the piece of information that you found. So I'm at the end. Uh, I just want to summarize what was the takeaway message of today, that is uh, uh, in Polyphonia, we had many challenges in uh, trying to put together so much information and trying to extract knowledge out of this uh, lot of information. We developed a pipeline based on ontology design, user interface and user experience design in order to make sense of the heterogeneous sources that we have. We developed a competing uh, distant reading approach to make sense of the content requirements and the interaction patterns. 
we designed a task analysis to distinguish and address different types of users. And we had a competitive analysis to characterize what is the final result of our work. That's all for me. I hope it was clear. I hope I didn't talk so fast. And uh, I hope you have questions, suggestions for me. Thank you.